turn this on. I've, I, I've been accused all my life that I have a lo loud enough voice that it doesn't make too much difference, but it sure makes it easier on everybody listening. So, again, we're glad that you are here this morning um, here at North Citrus Christian Church. If you are watching online, we welcome you as well. Uh, we're right here off of Elkham Boulevard uh, in Citrus Springs between Pine Ridge and Citrus Springs. We're here every Sunday morning at 1030 and would love to have you join us. So uh, if you are here visiting um, and maybe first uh, couple times you're visiting, if you haven't had a chance yet to fill out a Connect card, we really want to get some just contact information from you just so we can just kind of stay in touch. Uh, that's a little card that you're going to find in the pocket in front of you. Just simply get your name, address, phone number. If you could fill that out for us, that would be great. If you have any prayer requests, um, we will take those on that card as well. If you're here uh, and you've been here for a while and you have suggestions or comments, you can fill out one of those cards. On either end of the auditorium, you're going to find some wooden boxes. Uh, and then also in the back of the auditorium, that's where you can put your uh, Connect cards. Uh, and also this is where our regular members and attenders uh, put the offering. So we will not be passing a plate uh, this morning. Our philosophy is a very simple one, and that is that your gifts are between you and God, okay? And we're here simply to be a support. Now, granted, we have expenses of the church and things that need to be paid and uh, everything that's going on, so we greatly appreciate your gifts, uh, but we encourage you just to simply put your offerings in uh, for the church. And of course, if you have checks, you can just make them out to North Citrus Christian Church. Uh, there's a little uh, code uh, here, QR code, that will take you to the website. If you want to give electronically, securely, you can do it that way with either one-time gift or, or recurring gift. So I know that's the method that we use as far as that's concerned. So you won't have to worry about passing a plate uh, today. All right, we are thrilled uh, that we are in the middle of a rooted study. Uh, we had about 30 folks out here yesterday morning in what was called a prayer experience and had an opportunity to be a part of that and everything that's happening. And this is also our sermon series that we are continuing on uh, with the discipleship experience. So we're excited about that. So uh, if uh, for some reason you are looking to make a connection uh, to a group, uh, we will be picking up additional groups as we go. But Sunday morning is also an option for you. If you want to come during the 9 o'clock hour, we're in the Book of Romans, studying through that. And uh, we encourage you to be a part of that uh, for Sunday school. We meet back in what's called Citrus Cafe, where you pick up some coffee, uh, just kind of get the day started, and uh, kind of go from there. All right, other things that are happening, just want to give you a heads up. Next week is our monthly potluck, okay? So uh, we actually do a little sign up for the potluck to try to make sure we have a little bit more luck on the pots that come, okay? So uh, there is a sign-up sheet on the back if you know what you're bringing or have an idea what you're bringing. The way this works is this is just an opportunity for everybody just to get together. And right after church, we have a building next door, which is called our Life Center. So we just make our way over and uh, just bring your food in, put it in the kitchen, and then we'll get it over there. And then right after church, we'll enjoy a meal together. Okay, so that is the first uh, Sunday of each month. And so uh, that is next week. Uh, that that is happening. So we encourage you to uh, uh, consider being a part of that. And, that, you know, and this really gives you a chance to get to know each other a little better. You know how this goes on a typical Sunday. Hi, 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 bye, bye, bye. And then you have your worship service, which the worship service is the biggest part of why we're here, okay, to worship God. But we also want to get to know each other a little better, too. And so small groups give us that opportunity to do that. And uh, so do the fellowship times, uh, like potlucks and stuff like that. So uh, we want to encourage you to come. So just plan to stay after next Sunday uh, for that. Other things that are happening, uh, the camp out is coming with the Trail Life group. So that's ahead. So if you have any questions about that, get with uh, Scott, and uh, he'll help you with all the details uh, there. So that is all happening. And then also, do you want to say anything about a Trail Life pancake fundraiser? All right. Speak up here, Will. Is this on? All right, there we go. You got it. Yeah, so uh, we have our Trail Life uh, camp out this Saturday. Um, if you guys don't know what Trail Life is, we've got a lot of new faces here in the building. Uh, it's a uh, boy scouting organization, so think Boy Scouts, but with uh, a Christian focus, uh, focus on creating uh, disciples. Um, we've uh, had a, a, just a really great time uh, running that ministry uh, for a few months now. 
and we got about 30 boys in the troop, ages from 5 to 17, and we have our second camp out here at the church, actually, uh, this, or next upcoming Saturday, right? Um, we're going to meet at the church probably just after lunch, 1 o'clock, and we're going to have activities for the boys, um, learning some outdoor skills, fire building skills, uh, things like that, uh, and then having a potluck dinner that night, uh, and then camping over and waking up the next morning bright and early, having a uh, breakfast supplied by the troop, and then coming to church. So that'll be fun, and then our pancake fundraiser is the following Tuesday here at the church uh, around 6 p.m. We're having uh, breakfast for dinner. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. The boys will be uh, cooking and serving uh, breakfast for everybody who wants to show up. Uh, it's $8 at the door, and all the proceeds go to help fund the troops. So we'd appreciate it if you can come out and support us. So these are direct ministries of the church here. So even though they're kind of uh, organizations that have uh, regional support, this is our troop. This is our group uh, in raising uh, young men in Christian character. And so we want to be a big support uh, for them, help them out with the fundraising and stuff. So mark on your calendars uh, after that potluck on Sunday, mark that Tuesday night. Uh, the way that will work with our Rooted series, just to let you know we have some folks that come for Tuesday Night Rooted. We're going to join them at 6, right at 6 for the pancake. Okay, get together, breakfast, and then uh, at 6.30 we're going to cut out and then do our group that night from 6.30 to 8. So those of you that are part of that, that's how that's going to work. For that particular Tuesday, okay? Um, also, American Heritage Girls is in the process of forming, and I know there's folks that are involved in that and different things as well. Yes, Ms. Patty, you got something? Yes, by all means. If for yes. some reason you cannot make the pancake breakfast or you just simply want to give a donation for Trail Life USA, then just put a designation, Trail Life USA, and uh, we see, keep a separate accounting for that particular group. Also, in the, uh, just to let you know, we're also forming a group for, for, for girls, uh, Meriton Heritage Girls. Uh, it's a Christ-centered character and leadership development program, girls 5 to 18, and it's dedicated to the mission of building women of integrity through service to God, family, community, and country. We could not be more thrilled uh, to offer these programs as an extension of the church. So uh, these are great programs that not only folks here at the church are taking advantage of, but people from other churches and community. And uh, it's just a great outreach uh, for everybody. Okay, so with that said, um, let's uh, have some prayer time uh, together. I'm going to ask today um, that as we get ready for prayer, uh, let, let's all be standing, uh, first of all. We have a topic today that uh, is going to challenge all of us. And that topic very simply is, where is God in the midst of suffering. And so right now, I want you to just kind of prepare your hearts and minds, and I want to just give you um, about 30 seconds of silent prayer for you just to kind of seek out God and just lay it at his feet and say, God, I am dealing with this right now, and I could use your help, okay? So take time to do that just silently, and then I'll go ahead and, and lead us in public prayer. Oh, there's so many questions on our minds. Sometimes we have little answers. But Lord, thank God we know the one who ultimately is the answer, and that is you and your son, Jesus Christ. Father, that's where our faith comes in. We don't even necessarily see how things piece together or why things happen. But Lord, we know that you are there. We celebrate your presence today as we go into this time of worship. And Lord, just help us as we seek our hearts and our minds to reconnect with you and to put us back on our feet and the foundation that you have in moving forward. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. You're all already standing, but invite you now to join us in singing. We're going to start with the song, Raise a Hallelujah. So let's raise a hallelujah together. Hallelujah in the bread. 
presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. Hallelujah, heaven comes to fight for me.
God of all creation, of water, earth, and sky. The heavens are your tabernacle. Glory to the Lord on high. God of wonders beyond our Show 
seated as we lead into our communion meditation. Remote got weird. You might not be able to see it very well from that picture, but this represents the hardest thing I have ever done in my life, twice. Bonus points, does anybody know what rock formation that is? Hint, if you've ever played Oregon Trail, you have seen Chimney Rock, and then you have seen this before you died of dysentery. Or maybe you never got there because you died of dysentery. <laughs> anyway, that is Scotts Bluff National Monument. Uh, this is a beautiful rock formation out in western Nebraska, uh, not far from the Wyoming border. Um, there is a little Christian college uh, not too far, a couple miles from that, called Summit Christian College. And there is a race that is held there every year called the Summit to Summit. It is a 7.2 mile race, which, yes, that seems long um, because it is. But that's not the hard part of the race. Uh, this is a, like I said, a 7.2 mile race to the top of this rock formation. There are some paths that you are running on that are maybe six feet wide in the sheer cliff completely to the other side. And as you're going, even if you're walking up that, uh, that incline of the side of that uh, formation, your eyes play tricks on you and you get that weird vertigo feeling that you see in the movies with the panning and zooming um, and you feel really dizzy. So it's a really rather rough thing. Uh, and again, the pictures don't do anything justice. You cannot see the scale. But the base from the, the base of the formation to the top parking lot is a 435 foot rise. And so you have to run that on this race. And most of that 435 feet elevation gain is done in 0.8 miles. And if you've ever done any kind of racing or running or even hiking, um, that is a really difficult challenge. Now, the point of this is to say that you can't get off your couch and just go run that thing you will injure yourself severely. You, I mean, there might be some people who are just built naturally and they can maybe do that. But for most people, you cannot just get off on the couch and do that. You have to get ready for it. You have to endure a lot of training in order to make it to the end of that race. And not just training, like you have to put on a lot of miles in order to be able to run seven miles anyway. Uh, but then you can't just run on flat ground. Eventually, as you build up muscle tone and endurance, you have to start building in work going up steep inclines and hills over long distances so that you can be able to endure the torture that is this race. You have to do things that challenge your body, build up muscle strength, stamina, and cardiovascular performance. As you go through the training process, there are all kinds of aches. Your legs get so exhausted by the end of your runs and training that they sometimes are numb. There are cramps that happen because of electrolyte imbalances. And so it's really difficult to train for such a thing. And you have to push through because you know at the end of the day, the result is worth it. Once you get to the top of that monument, you can look out and you can see Colorado, you can see Wyoming, you can see Nebraska, this beautiful view. I mean, there's all kinds of, uh, wonderful geologic formations that you can see. It's just an amazing view. And then you have the satisfaction of having completed something extremely difficult. 
And so the reward is worth it. But as you train for such a difficult task, there are times when you want to quit. There are times in that race when you have already exhausted all of your energy reserves, and then you still have that 435-foot climb in front of you. Because you can't see it, but there are lots of little hills and dips and things leading up to that. And by the time you get there, you're already exhausted. And then you have to go up the inclines, and it is a bear. And you just want to throw in the towel. Especially if you're younger than me, and you have, you're running with somebody who's 20 years older than you, and they're faster. And they're talking on the phone to people while they're running, and they're still faster than you. And you're like, dude, I just want to quit. Thank you, Eric. And you tell yourself, I can't make it. But then there are cheers from onlookers that they stage in different places to help encourage you. Uh, you have encouragement for other runners. When they are seeing you slack behind, they're there to encourage you and say, you can do it. And then there are donuts at the end of the finish line. So you will keep going. Now, I, I really say all of this to visualize what we read about in Hebrews chapter 12. In Hebrews 11, uh, we are this. Uh, told about all of these people who live by faith in God and the amazing things that God had done in and through them. And it's in light of all of these uh, faithful people of God that the author of Hebrews goes on to say this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Those people of faith are cheering us on as we run our race of faith. The finish line of eternity with Jesus is waiting for us on the other end. And so to get there, we need the cheers of those in heaven. We need the cheers of others because the race is not easy and it requires much endurance. There is opposition. There is hardship. There are much, uh, many times of suffering. There are injuries. There are illnesses that we face, injustices that we experience in all manner of suffering. And so in the midst of this race of faith, it is easy for us to want to throw in the towel because it is too much to bear by ourselves. But this racing metaphor that we are given here helps us understand how God uses the hardships of this life, that these are the means by which he builds endurance in us. As we face these various trials and we seek him, his Holy Spirit will make us stronger. He will work in us, as the author says, to perfect our faith. It's not pleasant, but it is God's way. And if we rely on Jesus, we will get through it. And the reason why we can get through it, the way that we have that strength from Jesus, is because of the suffering that Jesus himself endured. Suffering that he endured long before we were ever born. The help that Jesus gives us is possible because of what he went through on our behalf. He endured the shame and the pain of the cross so that our sins could be forgiven and we can be reconciled back to God. And because of that new standing we have with Jesus, he has made his strength available to us. So as you think about the various sufferings that you have, maybe that you have endured in the past or that you are now enduring, Keep your eyes on Jesus. He will get you through. He loves you. He wants you to persevere. His death, burial, and resurrection are the proof and the power of that fact. And so as we eat the bread and we drink the juice, let us remember and let us give thanks for what Jesus endured for us so that we can endure all the challenges of this life, and that through his power, through his grace, we have overcome sin, death, and all of the trials of life. Let's pray. 
Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for what Jesus endured on our behalf. We're so grateful that he endured the scoffing and the shame and the torture and the death at the hands of the Romans. We're so grateful that he suffered and he endured with faithfulness and then in the end that he was raised back to life to forgive our sins and give us eternal life with you. So Father, I pray that you would help us to endure the trials of life uh, as we look on Jesus' suffering, knowing that you will help us to overcome, not just overcome the suffering and the trials, but overcome sin and death so that we will be with you forever. We pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Nine Eleven, JFK assassination, Sandy Hook Elementary, the Space Shuttle Challenger, Columbine, Hitler, the Hindenburg, the Titanic, worldwide flood. COVID pandemic, a painful divorce, suicide, drug overdose, murder, rape, abortion, broken dreams, job loss, house fire, death of a loved one, robbery, car accident, 
the phone call. Cancer. Paralysis. Amputation. Birth defects. Down syndrome. Bankruptcy. Betrayal. A friendship gone bad. Family tension. Loss of relationships. The death of a pet. Mental illness. Baker Act. Brain aneurysm. Stroke. Heart attack. Physical abuse. Sexual abuse. Addictions. PTSD. War. The unknown soldier. POWs. MIAs. Gunshots. Domestic violence. Child abuse. Child pornography. Poverty. Hunger. Starvation. The homeless. Substance abuse. Rebellious teenagers. Loss of a child any age. Elder abuse. Terminal diagnosis. Sudden death. Head trauma. Serious fall. Hurtful words that penetrate the heart and soul. Layoffs. Depression. Loneliness. Chronic pain. Ebola virus outbreak. Deaf. Blind. Alzheimer's disease. Shingles. Tornadoes. Hurricanes. And the list goes on and on. Father God, I just pray that you help us today to speak the very words of God. And Lord, we have questions with no answers. We wonder why. We wonder how. We wonder when will this ever end? Suffering, trying to make sense of it. Father, help your word to speak to the hearts of your people. And Lord, may you reach out and touch each person where they are this morning and give them a special touch of your mercy, and your grace, and your love. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn with me, if you will, to the Old Testament book of Daniel. Uh, you can certainly follow along with your sermon notes uh, this morning, which you'll find there in the program. And take a look at the book of Daniel at a very uh, no, well-noted uh, story. Many of you are familiar with uh, Daniel and the lion's den. This actually takes place prior to that time uh, with three friends of his, Daniel, uh, who has uh, become the ruler over Babylon, and he has his three friends along, uh, often known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, I have to admit, uh, growing up, uh, we were not really pet-friendly in our house. We started off with goldfish, and then we kind of, you know, graduated from there. So we went to hamsters, okay? So we had three hamsters, and you'll never guess what we named them. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And, and I always knew Abednego because his, t his tail was shorter and more crooked. I don't know what happened to him. He had some type of problem early in life. Uh, Shadrach and Meshach, I think their names got keep kind of pushed back and forth. I never could tell which one it was. But uh, these aren't hamsters. These were administrators along with Daniel uh, in Babylon. They were given a great responsibility. Why? Because uh, Daniel had great wisdom. When the uh, king Nebuchadnezzar had come to them and said, well, we're going to feed everybody this type of food, Daniel says, no, 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 no. Uh, give me water and vegetables. Okay, first case of a vegetarian. And that was actually the start of what was called veggie tales. Um, at that point. 
Um, so that's the story of what happened with Daniel and his friends. Uh, but they were put into a, a position of power and authority. Uh, Daniel wasn't involved directly in this instance, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as administrators uh, were brought before the king with the king having some uh, great responsibility and uh, quite a command that he is demanding of his uh, administrators. Here in Daniel chapter 3, I'm going to read Daniel 3 verses 1 through 12 to start off with. Now King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold. 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, the prefects, uh, the governors, the advisors, the treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officers to come to the dedication of the image that he had set up. So the satraps, the prefects, uh, the governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of this image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, This is what you are commanded to do, O peoples, nation, and men of every language. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and you must worship this image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, nation, and men of every language, they fell down. And they worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. And they said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You have issued a decree, O king, that everyone who hears the sound of the, the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, pipes, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And whoever does not fall down and worship be thrown into a blazing furnace. But I need to let you know, O king, that there are some Jews that you have set up over the affairs of the province of Babylon. And their names are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They pay no attention to you, O king. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold that you set up. Folks, this is an unusual situation, a situation that they have found themselves in. It's the reality of hardship and suffering. Now, you may not be in a position where you either are bowed down to some image of gold or be tossed into a fiery furnace, thank God. But have you been through some fiery furnaces through your lifetime? The fact of the matter is that all of us have experienced the reality of hardship and suffering. And if we were to take the time to share our stories with each other, we would all have our chins dropped to the ground because we didn't realize, oh, I didn't know that you went through this. I didn't know that you had to experience that in your lifetime. I didn't know that you're going through this right now. I, I didn't realize, I, I didn't, didn't, had no clue. All of us deal with suffering and hardship through life. No one is immune I'm not sure what situation of life that you find yourself in right now, but I do know that no matter what has happened or no matter what circumstance that you find yourself in, the one thing that you are given is a choice as to how to respond. You see, there's two things in life. There's things that we can't control, and there's things that we can control. And if we put all of our eggs in the basket of things that we can't control, it gets frustrating real fast. Because we can't control the fact that this person made that decision. We can't control the fact that, that this has happened in life or, or we're responding to this situation. And we can't control it and we can't get it back. And we, we can't, it, just, it, it fell apart. It fell to pieces. It just, we can't control it. But all we control is our response. Somebody once said that we can choose one of two paths. And that is based upon circumstances that have happened in life. Now, at this point, we can choose to either be better or we can choose to be bitter. Folks, I've met folks on both ends 
of that response. I have folks that are friends from high school that have never forgiven God because of something that happened back when they were a child. And they continue on Facebook just to blast it out to the world, and the bitterness is just so, so consuming. But yet, then I've met other folks that have been through hell and high water, and they praise God for every step of the way. You say, well, why the difference? Why such, such a, a polar opposite? Well, again, it becomes our choice. It becomes our response. It would have been very easy for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego with that kind of threat. It would be very easy. Oh, there, I'm down, I'm down. I'm down. I, I, I'm not going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. I'm not going to test the waters there. But no, they held on to their faith. They, they choose to be better. And they said, you know what? We're going to stick with this no matter what. Let's read the rest of the passage here as we move forward. Verses 13 through 18. At this point, Nebuchadnezzar is not happy with them. Okay? Furious with rage. Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the idol that I made, this image of gold that I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, then very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hands? You see, Nebuchadnezzar said, jump. And they said, no. Folks, there comes a time that we have to exercise what we call double-fisted faith. We will trust God in life and in death. We will trust him in good times and bad. Not only were uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being tested, but the faith of their God was being tested. This, this was in the face of God. Isn't it? Because oh, Then what God? Then what God can deliver you? If, if I send the worst upon you, and Satan had this discussion with God and when it came down to Job and everything that came upon the life of Job, and, and maybe it, this continues on in today's world. If this happens, then how will they respond? They're not going to hold on to their faith. They're not going to turn to you. They're going to be bitter. They're going to fall away. What God's going to help them at this point? Nebuchadnezzar is about to find out <laughs> what God will help. Folks, we need to exercise double-fisted faith. So what is double-fisted faith? Well, note what is said here. It lays it out in verses 16 through 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter, for if we are thrown into the blazing furnace... The God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But, verse 16, even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Double-fisted faith. So on one hand, God has the power and if God so chooses, and if God so desires, he can deliver, he can cure, he can prevent disease, he can find a way. And God is able to make a way where there seems to be a no way. He can save, he can rescue. That's double-fisted faith. That's the right fist. It's kind of like when things go right and you pump that fist and it's like, yeah, yeah, it finally went right. You know, and you go, yeah, yeah. Thank God. He answered the prayer. I give him praise. He, he did it. He did it. It can only be God. Did you see him at work? That's God. He's able to do it, and he came through. Yeah. But then there's the left fist. Shadrach, 
Meshach, and Abednego understood. And they said, you know what? We believe God's able, and I know he can, but even if he doesn't, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you set up. Even if your loved one dies, even if financial hardship comes upon you, even if disease and health and, and things just don't work out, and even if, even if your life seems to be falling apart quicker than it's piecing together, we will serve the living God. Folks, that's faith. Does it make logical sense? No. It doesn't make logical sense. And if you're trying to make logical sense of how God works and what happens in our lives and, and why good things happen to bad people and why bad things happen to good people, good luck. Because there is no reasoning. There is no logical sense. There are no answers to that question. We, we simply have to understand that, that God is here and we need to operate with double-fisted faith. And that we will trust him in life. And we will trust him in death. That we will trust him in the good times. And we will trust him in the bad times. It's hard. But we carry on with the rest of the story. Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. His attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual. And he commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent, and so the furnace was so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. And King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement. And he asked his advisors, wait a minute, were there not three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? Well, yes, certainly, O king. He said, look. I see a fourth man walking in the fire, and he's unbound, and he's unharmed, and the fourth man looks like the son of the gods. Folks, I've got good news for you today, and the good news is that we're not alone when we go through suffering in this life, and that God is in the middle of our suffering. Man, I cannot even imagine. I mean, we live here in Florida where there's heat. You know, it hits 100 degrees and we're like, oh, it's up 90s, 100, seven times hotter. Can you imagine 700 degrees? Oh, you set your oven to 400 to cook something. Can you imagine 2800 degrees? Seven times hotter. But yet, they were thrown in and God who is able to save them and rescue them, used some right-fisted faith. And he delivered them. Not only did he deliver them, but he was the fourth man in the fire. Folks, I don't know what you're going through today. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know where you've come from. I don't know what your experience has been. I don't know what your upbringing was. I don't know uh, all the experiences. But God is not going to leave you alone. He is in the middle of our suffering, and he is the fourth man in the fire. Now, we don't know exactly uh, how this was. Was this some type of special appearance of Jesus at this point? Was this some type of a son of God with a, an angel? or something? We don't know, but it was very clear to Nebuchadnezzar that there was a fourth man in the fire. God will not leave you alone through your suffering. He is there. Many people will say, well, where is God in the midst of the suffering? You know, that same question can be asked another way. Where is God in the midst 
of our suffering. That's exactly where God's at. He's in the middle. It's a different perspective, but it's one in which we choose. Notice what happened with uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It says that they were thrown in and they were bound. Uh, they, they were wearing uh, robes and trousers and turbans and clothes, and they were bound and thrown into the fiery furnace. And before they went, they were bound up, and there was no hope. And they were just thrown in, and they had to experience what they had to experience. But when they took a look at what took place, they were unbound when they came out. Folks, you may feel like you've been chained. You may feel like you've had some things come up on you that have just totally torn you down, broken your faith, broken down your hope, broken down everything that you believe in. You're just this ready just to let it go, and quite honestly, you don't want to be here anymore. You just want to check out and forget about life and forget about this world because it's given you a, a raw deal, and you're chained, and you're bound. But that fourth man of fire, I think he took off their clothes, and I think he unbound them, and then they began to dance around. And then they were all unbound there, because only God could do that. There was no way they could do that. Even the soldiers that were there to place him in the fire, they, they died because of the heat of the fire. They couldn't even stand it before they were even thrown into the fire. But God was there to unbound them and to unchain them. Folks, I'm telling you, God is still here today to unchain you from whatever events have happened in your life. It's not his fault. It's real easy to ask the questions. It's real easy to, to shake the fist. God, why? And God's got enough to take it. But God is faithful. And he can turn tragedy into triumph. So Nebuchadnezzar approached the opening of the blazing furnace, and he shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. And the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the royal advisors crowded around them, and they saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was there a hair on their heads, uh, was it singed? No. Their robes, they were not scorched. There was no smell of fire on. I can't even do that when I grill. I don't know about you, but I, just, I come back and it's like, wow, all these hairs got singed. And I walk in and it's like, oh, where'd you come from? I've been grilling. I mean, come on. Uh, then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise be. He finally figured out then what God. Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him. They defied the king's command. They were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be cut into pieces and their house will be turned into piles of rubber. What a nice guy. And no other god can save in this way. And then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Amen. God always keeps his word by looking out for our best interest. Now, this is hard to get your head around, but I do want to just kind of touch base with you from the heart. When we have questions like why, where, how, when, we don't have all the answers. In fact, I've learned through the years not to try to even answer those questions. Sometimes I just tell people I share your question. I don't know why God allows things to happen in, in our left fist and, and we can't stop and we can't control it. When he, when he answers the prayers, boy, it sure is nice. But when he doesn't, it sure is hard. But the fact of the matter is God never shirks what is called his fiduciary responsibility. Now, I want you to understand this. This is a legal term that is used. And perhaps you have financial advisors that are watching over uh, certain parts of your investments. They have a legal right to do what is in the best interest. They have to act by law to what is in your best interest. It's called fiduciary responsibility. Now, I want you to understand that because I want you to understand a little thing about God. 
God's not bound by any legal system here on this earth. But God has a spiritual law that he is always looking out for your best interest. Even when it makes no sense, even when we sit back and say, how in the world could God allow that? How in the world could we live in a world that is just so much full of crime and rage and, and rampant and, and sex and this, that, and the other thing? You see, God's not a divine killjoy. He takes no pleasure in our suffering, yet he is there. And God's spiritual law says, I am looking out for you. And I take responsibility to what is best for you. It's so hard because we think we know what's best. And it's hard when we have to let go of our own expectations, our own desires, our own wishes. Folks, I don't know what you're going through. I want you maybe to jot down or maybe to think some things that there are some tough times that you've gone through or maybe are going through as we speak. Those are things that you need to take to God and say, God, this is where I'm at. This is, you know, I, I don't get it. This, I, I don't get how did this happen? Why am I going through this? Why? I don't get it. And then lay at his feet and know that he has a spiritual law that he is looking out for your best interest. Are we going to understand it? On this side of heaven, no. My dad always told me, he said, Jonathan, he says, there are no guarantees this side of heaven. No guarantees in this life. Only in the one to come. And boy, that has played out so many times in our life. Things that have happened to you that's out of your control. It's not your fault, but it's happening to you. It's changed the whole course of your life. You've taken a left and when you were planning to take a right. And in plan A and B and C and D, they all fell apart and you're left there looking at plan E. You're wondering, where, where does this go from here? Well, folks, the only thing we can do again is respond to those tough times in our life. And there's several pointers that we have to help us with that. First of all, we need to learn to surrender to a good and gracious God. To surrender means to extend our arms and to give him our lives and say, you know, I don't understand it. I, I'm not going to have the answers. I want to have the answers, but I, I, I'm not going to have the answer. I just give it to you and I trust you that you are looking out for my best interest. I trust you that by your spiritual law that, that this isn't just some happen chance. This, this isn't something that I'm, I'm being punished for. This isn't something that, you know, you're some divine killjoy. No, I, I trust you. And not only do I trust you, but I'm going to follow Jesus. Because you gave your only begotten son to die upon the cross so that I might have life. And no matter what, even if it doesn't work out, I'm going to follow Jesus. Even if, I know you're able, and I know you can, but even if you don't choose to, I'm, I'm still going to hold on to Jesus. I'm still going to hold on to my faith during the bad times, as well as the good. The scripture is full of passages uh, to help us in this regard. This is just a small sampling and taking a look at some of this. Psalm 147 and verse 3 tells us that he heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. I'm counting on it, God, because I need your help. I need your help. Uh, the book of Isaiah uh, goes on to, to share with us about no matter what happens in life, that, that he is there to help us and, and to guide us. And, and even though things are falling all around us, that he is there to be a support. But now this is what the Lord says, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, and you are mine. And when you pass through the waters... I will be there. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Amen? Isaiah 54, verse 10, Though the mountains be shaken, the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken. 
Will my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. And no matter what happens, there's a promise from Jesus. A promise that simply says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Oh, what a classic passage comes out of the book of Romans 8, 28. It's one to hold on to. And it simply says this, And we know that in all things God works for the good. Again, he has that fiduciary responsibility, that spiritual law at work that he's always looking out for our best interest. He works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Again, it takes time to get our heads around these, but the scripture is full of this encouragement. And this perhaps is one of the hardest ones to get our head around. From James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Now, when we say joy, we're not talking about happiness. None of us are happy because of situations that have happened, of suffering, of losing loved ones. Nobody's happy. But joy is the bridge that goes over life circumstances. It goes over the troubled waters that we experience beneath. Consider it the bridge. God has built a bridge. Even though you're going through this life and there's no way around it, and all of us have to experience it's our reality on this side of heaven, God has built a bridge to test our faith, to develop perseverance, to finish its work so that we may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Jesus loves you even when things don't work out. You see, Jesus has compassion on us. Many people don't realize that the word compassion actually is two separate words, going back to a Latin root, uh, meaning to suffer with. With suffering. With That's who Jesus was. He suffered with us. That's who God is. He wasn't going to let us suffer by ourselves. He sent his only son to die upon the cross so that we might have compassion. We might have something to hold on to through this life. That we we can hold on to him, and he's there to help us every step of the way. That's who God is. Many of you are familiar with this beautiful poem that has been shared through the years. I'd like to read it again for you now. One night a man had a dream. He dreamed he was walking along the beach with the Lord. And across the sky flashed scenes from his life. For each scene he noticed two sets of footprints in the sand. One belonging to him and the other to the Lord. And when the last scene of his life flashed before him, he looked back at the footprints in the sand. And he noticed that many times along the path of his life that there was only one set of footprints And he noticed that it happened at the very lowest and saddest times of his life. And this really bothered him. And he questioned the Lord about it. And he said, Lord, you said that once I decided to follow you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I've noticed that during the most troublesome, suffering times, horrible times in my life, there's only one set of footprints. And I don't understand why. Why is it when I needed you the most, you would leave me? And the Lord replied, My son, my precious child, I love you, and I would never leave you. During your times of trial and suffering, when you only see one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. There will be a day 
Read with me, if you will. It's a passage from Revelation. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Folks, it's a tough question. It's not one that there's any ready answers that's going to satisfy our human minds. But the scripture is clear on the answer. Where is God in the midst of our suffering? God is right there with us as the fourth man in the fire. Worship team, if you would come at this time. Folks, I'm not here today to say I understand um, what you've been through, because I'm, I'm clueless. I, I'm totally clueless. I've not walked where you've walked. I've not been where you've been. Uh, do I have my own set of uh, challenges and things through life? Oh, yeah, most definitely. I can tell you about those experiences, <laughs> but I, I can't touch where you've been. And there's only one person who can walk where you've walked and been where you've been. And that's Jesus Christ. He is the healer. You may have lots of questions. I can't provide you all those answers. In fact, I share your questions. I just know that somehow, some way, we have to trust in the God of all the universe who created us in the first place, who is still watching over us, and whose spiritual law is still in effect, that he is still looking out for our best interest, in spite of everything that happens in this sinful world, in spite of th things that maybe happened to us that we had no control over, or things that we made decisions ourselves and had to pay the consequences. God is still God, and he's still there. Where is God? He's in the middle of your suffering. If you're here today and you want to respond to the love of God through Jesus Christ, the one who had compassion, who suffered with us, who died upon the cross for our sins, we want you to come. If you have questions, we're here to, to help. Joe and I are available um, just to talk with you, uh, perhaps to, uh, to put your life in order, to believe upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to repent, to confess of your sins, to, to be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and then to continue walk in the way that God has called you to walk from this day forward. If you're here this morning, you've already made those decisions, you've already taken those steps, and you're looking for a church home, and say, you know what, I think I found my, my home right here at North Citrus, then we encourage you to come, and that we don't require any more than what God requires with the scripture, and if you've already taken those steps, we will simply welcome you um, with open arms. Let's be standing uh, as we sing. Count on one thing The same God that never fails Will not fail me now You won't fail me now Keep the waiting The same God is never late You're working all things out You're working all things out Oh yes I Hey. 
same God that fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now. No waiting. For the same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you high. encourage you today as uh, you work through uh, this life, by all means, um, take these things to God, lay them at his feet. Um, we have the, the unknown and the fear of the unknown and what, what's around the next corner, where we've been, where we're going, but trust in him with the presence that is there. But folks, you don't have to go through this alone either. Feel free to reach out um, to somebody else that can be helpful. Feel free to give us a call. Feel free to, we want to do life together, okay? And all of us all of us go through tough times. God is there, but sometimes you, can, you need somebody with skin on, okay, uh, to help you through. And we want to be there for you as well. Let's pray. Father God, uh, we love you, and we just praise you, <sighs> even in the storms. And that's hard to say. It's hard to even get a concept of what it means to joy. I mean, how can, how can you even be joy? How can you even say that? How can you even consider that? But Lord, we do know and we do trust you that you are looking out for our best interest. Father, we lean on you and we ask for your help, and your encouragement, and your strength as we choose to be better and not bitter. Thank you, God, for being in the middle of our suffering. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week, everybody.